Uh, you know, we've talked a lot over the last um, day or so about the importance of you know, creating value systems, of communicating them to your employees, of taking care of the people in your business, of responding to consumers, of the importance of managers. But we really haven't talked at all about a group of the, of the personnel population in fashion and luxury that is incredibly important and often in contexts like this one entirely overlooked. You know, yet they are crucial to creating the image of a brand, communicating the image of a brand, representing a brand, and that is models. So, I mean, what's the deal? How come we never talk about them? <laughs> it's funny because, as you said, we are the most visible workers in the supply chain. We're the faces of these big multinational companies. Um, and yet, when you sort of look beyond the glossy facade, the working conditions can actually be pretty deplorable. Um, and I say this um, as you know, one of the lucky ones who worked as a face of big brands, but also experienced some of the pitfalls of working in what remains a largely unregulated industry. And those pitfalls being? Uh, pressures to uh, appear nude, um, even as a minor, um, having, uh, you know, pressures to succumb to sexual demands, which are totally inappropriate, um, difficulty getting paid the money owed by uh, the modeling agency, even though I was working for the, the top modeling agencies in the world. Um, uh, I personally didn't experience this, but many of my peers were pressured to lose weight. Um, so I could go on and on. And is it the issue, do you think, that because models are independent contractors, because they're essentially freelancers, I guess, um, brands don't seem to feel responsibility for their well-being? Where is the disconnect? I think that it, it, you have to start with appreciating that modeling is a job. And like anyone else who works for a living, we deserve to be treated fairly. Um, and I think what m many people might not recognize is that most of these girls, and it is largely a labor force of, of young women and girls, start working when they're very young, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old, and they're thrust into this very adult environment with adult pressures. Um, the, the concerns around the extreme thinness of these girls and the sort of unrealistic beauty ideal, I think, are, are well known. What's less well known is the fact that you know many of these girls are kids. Um, their adolescent physique is you know they're naturally gangly, and if they start out in the business that young, they're then pressured to maintain those measurements as they fill out as you are supposed to. Um, and of course now the, the the focus has really turned to the issue of sexual harassment. What my colleague Steve Erlanger called the post-Weinstein world. I mean, clearly these issues have become very much part of the public conversation over the last couple of weeks, you know, not just in terms of what's happening in Hollywood or other sectors, but also in fashion. And, um, and there has been change. I mean, you know, LVMH and Caring earlier this year, even pre-Weinstein signed, you know, created and signed a model charter. It was about the working conditions of women under their care. Um, Condé Nast has, you know, served notice to, um, to its contractors that they have to watch out for what's going on. Why do you think those steps have happened now and will they make a difference? Well, first I'd like to commend Caring and LVMH on their charter because it is a, a really important first step. Um, you know, the, the part of the problem is uh, that what we found, we looked at the laws on the books. Um, and even just a few years ago, when I first formed the Model Alliance, which is a, a research policy and advocacy organization in the modeling industry, um, we found that in New York, the fashion capital of, you know, in the US, we didn't even have child labor protections. We were, we were cut out of child labor law. 
um, and we champion legislation to, to correct that. But uh, more recently, when we, when we, when we looked at uh, the protections against sexual harassment, again, we were cut out. Models currently in the US are not protected against sexual harassment in the workplace. And that's why we've uh, introduced the Models Harassment Protection Act in New York State, um, which would afford models protection against sexual harassment and other forms of harassment. Um, but, you know, it's funny, the, uh, the fashion industry seems to be woefully behind when you sort of, when you look at the labor practices in place for, 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 for people who appear to have a very glamorous job. We were talking earlier about, Natalie brought up vulnerabilities in the supply chain, you know, largely in terms of you know, what happened in the jewelry industry, what's happened in, you know, manufacturing with, um, with sweatshops. Is modeling the kind of last place of vulnerability in the supply chain? Oh, I mean, the fashion industry is an industry that is essentially built on the backs of women and girls. Um, and although it's supposed to be for women, when you look at the people in positions of power, you know, many of the people on this stage have been male, CEOs. Uh, when you look at the photographers who are working behind the scenes, it's almost all men. Um, and so although the models are highly visible, um, you know, often we don't have very much power in the system. And then when you, when you look at the opposite end of the supply chain, I mean, the garment industry, as we all know, is, you know, over 80% women who are also trying to have a voice in their work. Um, so, my, my broad vision for the work that, that I would like to do with my life is to really look at the whole supply chain and to think about how we on the modeling industry can leverage our platform to uh, not only improve our working conditions, but uh, amplify the voices of women who are, are less visible and who are literally risking their lives on the job in some cases, mm. just going to work. I mean, speaking of speaking up, how hard has it been for you, you know, in starting probably the first organization that's really given models a platform to talk, to actually get them to speak? Because, you know, we sort of talking about what's happened over the last couple of weeks, you know, a model called Cameron Russell allowed um, or invited her colleagues to post anonymously on her Instagram page, often anonymous, um, allegations about what had happened to them. And, you know, there's been a lot of action there, but there hasn't been that much of people really willing to stand up and say, okay, me, I'm talking now and I want to be counted. So how hard is it to get girls to do that? It's very difficult. I mean, in an industry where image is everything, then of course it's, it's, it's challenging to voice your concerns. And I know, and my friends in the industry know that when we have gone even to the presidents of, of top modeling agencies and talked about uh, predatory photographers and other people who abuse their power, um, our concerns have sort of been shrugged off often. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that what we're seeing now with the sort of hashtag Me Too and posting to social media, obviously speaking out is a powerful and cathartic first step. But that doesn't solve the problem. And we all know that, you know, the news cycle goes on to the next exciting thing. And, um, and what my hope is that we're not going to, in this mo moment, forget that we really need to take a really hard look at our workplace uh, policies and cultures and demand change. Right, right because you made a, a documentary in 2009, right, eight years ago. Right. And it, it had a big impact. Everyone, there's a lot of press. Everyone got very excited about it. And then they moved on. Right. So how, how do you make sure that, you know, what is the kind of the story of the moment doesn't, you know, just as part of the news cycle turn into another story, but actually, you know, real change comes out of it? I mean, having good policies is part of the equation. But if you look at, for example, Fox News, they had good policies, but apparently that wasn't enough. Um, so you need good policies, but you also, frankly, need worker power. And that comes in the form of unions or worker associations. Um, and 
the Model Alliance is part of a new wave of labor activism where we're trying to think about a new model for the labor movement. Um, as independent contractors, we're mm -hmm. unable to unionize, and so we're kind of, we're, we're in an experimental phase now. Um, but if you really want to look at making sure that labor standards and rights are enforced, I think you have to look to who has the best information on mm -hmm. the working conditions and who has the greatest incentive to make sure that they are held to a high standard. And who is that? That's the workers themselves, right? It is not someone parachuting in from the outside um, telling people how things should work. It's, it's, it's the models themselves, the garment workers on the ground. And, and I would really encourage anyone in this room to make an effort to speak with grassroots women labor leaders. Um, there are many of them, and I'd, I'd be happy to introduce you. <laughs> Because uh, I know that you know that might not be the the people who you normally speak with, some of you, but uh, they are the experts on their working conditions and the changes that need to be made. A lot of what you're talking about is is sort of U.S. centric. I mean, fashion and luxury this is a global industry. So how does that work? How do you balance you know laws in the U.S., laws outside, conditions in you know companies that span the globe, but are have different responsibilities? Yeah, I mean, the fashion industry has always been one in the garment industry that is very fractured. And I think that, um, you know, having a culture of responsibility really needs to start at the top. And you need um, top industry leaders who are urgently behind um, creating that, that culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that part of the issue with modeling, too, is that, you know, for a company books a photographer to do an ad campaign, who books the model? I mean, who is actually has the responsibility for how that relationship develops? You know, is it the brand whose name is on the pictures? Is it the agency that theoretically is responsible for the girl or the woman? You know, is it the photographer who's creating the scenario? I mean, isn't that the problem? Is that no one accountability is very confused? Right. Yes, and so that's the problem in the modeling industry with respect to sexual harassment. When you have this multi-level structure of hiring, um, no one is really being held accountable. Um, so, you know, I think that companies, if, if, if you, obviously there's a moral incentive here, but simply to avoid reputational risk um, and, and knowing that, you know, these girls who are, going to brands castings and walking in their shows and, um, and are the faces of these companies um, and are on social media and in some cases have a, a bigger following than the brands themselves. Um, you really want to make sure that you have policies in place to, um, to uh, avoid issues around sexual harassment. Uh, if you really want to avoid sexual harassment on set, hire Hire more women. <laughs> there are fantastic, um, you know, female creative directors, photographers, and so on. Um, I, I hate to say this, but I'm sure women can engage in sexual harassment too. I mean, it's know. possible, but I have yet to see, uh, you know, a hashtag uh, social her media too, storm. hashtag her too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. Uh -huh. uh, no, and uh, you know it, you're, it, it's good that you're pointing out that this is uh, you know it's not entirely one-sided. At the Model Alliance, we have a grievance reporting service, um, and and many models and actually other industry professionals have have confidentially reported their concerns. I would say that it's just as many male models come to us as female models, um, and I think it's it's doubly difficult for the men to speak out. Um, because they're experiencing predatory behavior from other men. So, I mean, is the, is the kind of part of the solution to this, you know, having agencies work more closely with companies or companies work more closely with agencies? Is it the women, you know, empowering the women themselves? Is it public accountability? You know, what is the sort of the next step to, you know, 
making this the beginning of a new stage and not just a return to the old stage? I think a, a very good uh, intermediate step, which LVMH and Caring have done, is to develop a code of conduct. And that goes not just for employees, but for contractors who are often not thought of in this equation. Um, I think a great next step would be for brands to make sure that um, there's accountability uh, with, with the agencies uh, that they're doing business with and that, they, that the agencies have policies and programs in place to make sure that labor standards are respected. Um, you know, I had a, a meeting recently with a, a, a large group of uh, young female models and uh, with, with the lawmaker who's sponsoring our, our bill. And I asked them, uh, raise your hand if you have been put on the spot uh, at a shoot or a casting to uh, appear nude. Every hand in the room went up, every single one. Um, so it's very clear that this is a pervasive problem. Uh, when, when I was in a meeting recently with the head of agencies and we discussed, uh, you know, what policies or programs they have in place to address these concerns, it became clear that they're, they didn't have any. Um, so, I, you know, I think there's a, we're just at the beginning of, of uh, addressing these issues, which, which span the entire supply chain. And uh, in terms of, of brands wanting to think about what they could do sort of more globally, uh, I know that the ILO is, is thinking about uh, uh, having a convention on gender-based violence at work, which will be determined, I think, in June of 2018. If you want to get out in front of these issues, then it would be fantastic for, for brands to, to, to support that initiative. Okay, I have one final question, and then we'll go to everyone else here. Um, what is the risk if you don't? I mean, we've, we saw what happened with Terry Richardson and Valentino getting attacked um, and having to disassociate itself and Diesel getting attacked. But that, you know, that, again, like that went quiet pretty fast. So, you know, what could happen if people don't kind of investigate their own, you know, their own pasts, I guess? <laughs> there are many Weinsteins. <laughs> there are many Weinsteins in our industry, as in other industries. Um, and it's been interesting to see how, you know, kudos to the New York Times for, mm -hmm. um, for catalyzing everyone in this, this, this discussion, um, how media companies and other, you know, stakeholders have really risen to the occasion in the last couple of weeks and are taking this issue very seriously. What could happen? <laughs> <laughs> what could happen? Well, um, I don't think anyone wants to uh, be associated with child abuse, with, um, you know, if, if your brand image is, uh, you know, it's about empowering women, um, you know, having uh, photographers or stylists or uh, creative directors uh, telling girls that they have to provide sexual favors at a casting um, in order to get the job, that's, that's probably not something that you want um, associated with your brand. I would think that's probably true. <laughs> All right, uh, questions from the audience for Sarah. Alex? Good morning. Um, I work at Oscar de la Renta. We employ lots of models. Um, our, our relationship is almost exclusively with the agencies. And um, while I would not say that we have expressed uh, a code of conduct as some of our peers have, we definitely have a code of conduct. It comes from my office. Um, the agents, as to things like underage, frequently lie. Um, we have situations where we got into some hot water for putting uh, a beautiful girl on the runway who was underage, but we were told specifically otherwise. There was litigation around it. Um, I find the agencies, well, you said culture of responsibility. They are the opposite. Um, and I'm not telling you anything that I haven't told them directly. 
I think that they are the first line of defense. I hope the Model Alliance is pressing hard with the agencies to make sure that they actually develop some codes of conduct and, and responsibilities. Because, you know, we as a brand, now photographers are perhaps a bit different, but we as a brand, we don't have a relationship with you as the model. We have a relationship with the agency. And they are, they need to make progress, in my opinion. Maybe you could comment. But can, I, can I just ask a question? I mean, if, if an agency tells you a girl is 18, can't you just ask her to double check? Well, this is, this is what I told our team. I said, you know, we're going to have to card them. Um, I mean, this is really what we're going to have to do because the agents, they want to make their commission and they'll tell us whatever we want to hear in order to get their girl on the runway. It is awful. Um, they, are a, they are a group that are not particularly scrupulous, in my opinion. Okay. Um, Thank you for that comment and question. I, um, I, it, to give you a little background, uh, modeling agencies used to be licensed and regulated as talent agencies, talent employment agencies. Um, and in the 1970s, starting with Ford models, um, they changed their corporate structure to management companies. And as management companies, they have absolutely no responsibility to uh, the talent whose interests they're supposed to represent. Um, they are not required to be financially transparent. Um, they are not required to abide by child labor laws. Um, and so I, you know, uh, I'm interested in working with agencies as well, but I would say that the most resistance that the Model Alliance has experienced has actually been from the agencies. Um, so I, I, I agree that, that they need to uh, take a stand here. Um, and, and be more accountable. Okay, well, sorry, one last question, and then we do have to go, because we are way out of time. I'm really touched. <laughs> I, I mean, we didn't know that, you know, this is the background of the faces that we see. But uh, how many uh, girls do they have the passion to become this, or they really need it? They're two different things. I mean, it, it's an aspirational business, right? So there are far more girls um, and boys who are going to want to become models and are actually going to get legitimate modeling work. And that's another reason why the fact that the agencies that are sort of the gatekeepers, um, not having any uh, requirement to be responsible to their well-being um, is problematic. Uh, but you know, many models are the primary breadwinners for their families, and they're sending money back home to Eastern Europe, Brazil, wherever they're from. Often they're, you know, in a big city, uh, unaccompanied, um, without any kind of parental support. Um, I was fortunate, you know, I started modeling at 14 years old, but my family was with me in New York, and it's not like I dropped out of school. Many of these girls actually will drop out of school thinking that they have to kind of gra gra grab the brass ring while they can. Another reason, uh, besides the, uh, the physical demands, uh, not to hire underage models. Okay, so upshot is it is on you, I think, to make this one better. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you. Okay.